Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Williams, Programs and Community Partnerships Manager at Chabot Space and Science Center, and we are thrilled to bring another exciting program live into your homes this evening. Thank you for tuning in. Tonight we have with us planetary scientist Dr. Pascal Lee. He will be taking us through six key phases of early training to become a future Mars explorer. We are so excited to bring you this talk in partnership with the SETI Institute. And we have Simon Steele from the SETI Institute here with us to say a few words. Simon, thank you for joining us. Of course, thank you, Jessica. And good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Simon Steele. I'm the Director of Education and Public Outreach at the SETI Institute. And uh, we're all very excited about this. It's the first in a series of joint Chabot Space and Science Center and SETI Institute talks. Um, on the most exciting topics of space science and space exploration. Uh, for those of you who don't know the SETI Institute well, SETI stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Uh, we are a nonprofit research center situated across the bay from Chabot in Mountain View uh, with over 100 scientists. And our mission is to search for life beyond Earth, everything from microbes on Mars to the most advanced alien civilizations. So if you'd like to know more about the SETI Institute, please do go to our website, uh, SETI.org. And you can also sign up for our e-newsletter as well and, and keep in touch with all our latest uh, uh, scientific expeditions and discoveries. Um, anyway, so without further ado, uh, what better way to start these series of talks uh, than to hear about the exploration of Mars with Dr. Pascal Lee. So I'll say good night and I'll hand it back to you, Jessica. Thank you, Simon, and thank you to the SETI Institute. We're so excited about this partnership and the future talks that are coming down the road. And now I would love to introduce to you all Dr. Pascal Lee. Dr. Pascal Lee is a planetary scientist with the SETI Institute, the Mars Institute, and the NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. He received his doctorate in astronomy and space sciences from Cornell University, where he was Joseph Viverka's last graduate student and Carl Sagan's last TA. Dr. Lee's research focuses on the history of water on the moon and Mars, the origin of Mars's moons, and planning for the future human exploration of moon and Mars. He has led over 30 expeditions to the Arctic and Antarctica to study Mars by comparison with the Earth. And Dr. Lee is the editor, I'm sorry, the director of the NASA Houghton Mars, Mars Project, the leading moon and Mars exploration field research project on Devon Island, Arctic. He also led the Northwest Passage Drive Expedition, the first road vehicle crossing of the fabled Northwest Passage and the subject of the award-winning documentary film, Passage to Mars in 2016. He was also a scientist pilot for the first field test of NASA's Lunar Electric Rover, a concept vehicle astronauts may one day drive uh, to the moon and Mars. Dr. Lee's first book, Mission Mars, won the 2015 Prize for Excellence in Children's Science Books from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And we actually have five of these books that we will be raffling off during our program. Comment in the chat with your first name if you would like to enter the raffle and we will randomly choose five of you to send the book to and we will contact you after the program. So be sure to put your name in the chat to be entered to win one of these books uh, by Dr. Lee. And we will also be taking a few questions from the audience at the end of Dr. Lee's talk. So be sure to post your questions in the chat at the end of the program. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Do you hear me? Sounds good. Yep. Do, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. good. All right. Uh, well, I'm, I'm very uh, honored to be here. Uh, I am very grateful, actually, to the Chabot Space and Science Center uh, and the SETI Institute, my home institution, uh, to, for organizing this. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to jump into this talk. Uh, the, the book that I wrote, uh, Mission Mars at Scholastic, was actually a, a big team effort. Uh, and uh, what we were hoping to achieve with this book is, is uh, something that would engage kids and stimulate them in, in, in studying science, technology, engineering, uh, math, uh, and but at, at the same time also uh, aspire to be part of uh, humanity's journey to Mars. Uh, because Mars, going to Mars is gonna be the 21st century's uh, greatest adventure and we're working on it. I work at the SETI Institute, but also with the Mars Institute and, and NASA, especially at NASA Ames. And I can tell you that NASA is really uh, serious right now about uh, 
going back to the moon first, and at the same time paving the way for us to, to go to Mars uh, a little bit farther down the road, but not very far. Uh, the first humans who will go to Mars are probably already around. In fact, it could be some of you kids out there. And I, I just hope that this uh, little training session will give you a head start on becoming uh, a future Mars explorer. Uh, the other thing I want to say is uh, being a future Mars explorer doesn't necessarily mean you're an astronaut. You could be a scientist uh, who will stay on Earth but will send super robots to Mars, including you know, in the future drones and things that can fly around on Mars. Uh, you might want to be a, 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 a flight director, somebody who's going to be monitoring and, and making sure astronauts are having a safe and productive mission and actually the actual director of the mission back here on Earth. So there are many roles that you can play as a future Mars explorer. You're not just necessarily uh, an astronaut up there, although uh, it'd be fun to go for sure. So let me get started with this. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Do you guys see this? Yes. Yes. So uh, let me get started. First phase of training. There are six phases. First phase of training. Uh, you are going. We're going to have you discover uh, Mars. So this means learning about Mars. Uh, Mars is, of course, a planet in our solar system. This is the solar system shown to scale uh, in the sense that the planets are shown in, directly in terms of their relative sizes, uh, but their distances, of course, is not properly shown here because there's actually a huge amount of space. Uh, but it's convenient to look at things like this. And so you can see that the main body in the solar system, of course, is the sun. Uh, we are here on Earth with our one big moon uh, and we essentially have two options to, to go to past the moon. We have either Venus, which is actually technically uh, closer than Mars, uh, or we can go to Mars. Venus is not a good idea because it's super hot. The temperature at the surface of Venus, no matter where you go, at the poles or at the equator, is 495 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature inside a pizza oven while you are baking pizza. Uh, so that's not a pleasant place to go. Mars, on the other hand, is farther from the sun, therefore it's colder. But you can protect yourself from the cold. You just, you know, put some, put put some something on, and you actually can be a productive explorer on Mars. Okay. Uh, so this is why we want to go to Mars is because it's conveniently located. But there's another thing that's interesting about Mars. Uh, it's a place where we might have a chance to find life. And so it combines two things that are really uh, inviting. One is the fact that it's close in a relative sense. And second, it might tell us something about uh, alien life and the origin of life altogether uh, by going there. Now, how far is Mars? Well, here you have it. At the top, you can see the Earth and the Moon. The Moon is this little gray blob here. I don't know if you see it. Uh, on the far end of, of uh, on, the, on the right hand side. Uh, the Earth and Moon, <clears throat> this is the, the Earth and Moon to scale. So the Earth is this size, that's how small and how far our Moon is. It takes, uh, with current rockets, it takes about three days for you to get to the Moon. So, you know, you can, you can launch on a Monday morning and you get to the Moon Wednesday night. Uh, once you get to the Moon, you can stay there as long as you want. You know, let's say you hop around for, for one day. Uh, and then you have to fly back. You catch a flight Friday morning, three, three days to fly back. You're back home Sunday night. Monday morning, you're back in school or, or back at home right now. Uh, anyway, you can do a round trip to the moon in one week. That's what the Apollo astronauts you know, were more or less doing uh, something like 50 years ago. Uh, going to Mars is a different ball game. At the bottom here, you have the sun in the middle. It's going around the sun in this uh, blue uh, orbit. And it takes the Earth 365 and a quarter day, roughly, to make one full circle around the sun. Uh, so that's called a year. And of course, the moon is going around the Earth meanwhile. So the moon is spinning around the Earth while the Earth is going around the sun. Uh, Mars is located farther out. It has more distance to cover. It's traveling also more slowly. 
not just because it has more terrain to 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 cover, so to speak, on its orbit around the sun, but it's it's traveling more slowly. So sometimes the Earth is so the Earth is constantly passing Mars as it goes around the sun. Sometimes the Earth is very close to Mars when it's on the same side uh, as as Mars is from the sun. Uh, and sometimes the Earth and Mars are at maximum distance between each other when the Earth and Mars are on opposite sides of the Sun. At that point, when they are on opposite sides of the Sun, Mars is a thousand times farther away uh, from the Earth than our Moon is. So those of you who are wanting to become a future Mars explorer, you have to be prepared to journey yourself or send your best friends and people you know uh, a thousand times farther away than our moon in the sky. And it's, it's, a, it's quite a challenge. It's quite a challenge. Should you accept it, this is the planet that you are going to be visiting. So on this, uh, you have on the left here the Earth and the moon to scale. In other words, this is also not the true distance, of course, between the moon and the Earth, just to show you their sizes. Uh, the moon is quite a bit smaller than the Earth, and which is why when you are on the moon, you, you weigh so much less. Your, your body doesn't change in gravity on the moon. You are pulled in less strongly by the moon than you are on the Earth. And so on the Earth, when you're standing or even when you're sitting, you feel heavy. On the moon, you would feel pretty light, actually. You, you feel six times lighter than on the Earth. So let's say, let's say you weigh on the Earth 100 pounds. Uh, on the moon, you would feel that you weigh six times less, only, only in other words, only six, 17 pounds, okay? Uh, Mars is halfway in size, roughly, between the Earth and the moon. Gravity on Mars is 38% of what it is on the Earth. So if you weigh 100 pounds on Earth, you would feel that you weigh only 38 pounds on Mars, okay? Whatever your high-jumping... Uh, record is on Earth, you can jump to uh, roughly two and a half times higher on Mars. Okay, so it'd be a lot of fun to have like a like a gym or a basketball court on Mars. So you don't have to wear a spacesuit while you're inside. But then you could you could do these giant leaps. Uh, you know, you could play basketball and then to keep the game fair, you'd have to raise the hoop of the of the basketball court, uh, you know, two and a half times higher, because you can jump two and a half times higher. Anyway, it'd be a lot of fun. I don't know about you, but I'd, I'd go just for that. Uh, all right. <clears throat> now, Mars is actually not a very pleasant place. I mean, there's some good things going for you, and they are listed there on the left. There's plenty of water on Mars. It's mostly in the form of ice, but there's water. Uh, the day on Mars is, so that's kind of convenient. Uh, but beyond that, there's not a lot that's really pleasant and familiar for, for you on Mars. Here's a list here on the right-hand side of the bad things that you have to always remember when you are exploring Mars. These are the five things that will kill you in chronological order of cause of death. Okay, so this is almost a joke because once you're dead, you're dead. You don't have to worry about the others. But the first thing that will kill you if you just stepped outside on Mars without being protected by you know, a spacesuit, uh, or, uh, you know, if you're not inside a shelter, a habitat, the first thing that will kill you is the very low atmospheric pressure on Mars. The air on Mars is very thin. It's so thin that it's not able to contain the gases that you normally need in your bloodstream, uh, like the oxygen and the nitrogen that you breathe, okay, when you are breathing here on Earth to the point where if these gases are not contained, they're just gonna boil out boil out of your blood. Okay, so you will essentially fizz to death on Mars. The, the oxygen and the nitrogen that, that are in your bloodstream, in your arteries, in your blood vessels, they would just uh, uh, be turn into gas bubbles. Just like when you are popping a, a can of Coke and, and uh, you know, the carbon dioxide turns into bubbles inside the Coke. Uh, and, and that's gonna to lead to your death within seconds. Now, let's say that didn't kill you. Well, the air itself is not even breathable. It's not like it's oxygen. And even if it was oxygen, the air is too thin for you to breathe, but it's not made of oxygen. It's made of carbon dioxide, which is a toxic gas, which is why we tell kids it's, it's a toxic gas. And meanwhile, it's the gas that you, 
that comes out of your lungs when you're breathing. It's, you need to breathe in oxygen, but then once the oxygen goes through your body, it comes, you don't want to be breathing that carbon dioxide that's coming out of your body because that's a toxic gas for us. Okay, we need oxygen to, to live, not carbon dioxide. This is why we tell kids never to put a plastic bag over their heads, okay? Because if you put a plastic bag, you're going to surround your head with the, the gas that's coming out of your lung with the carbon dioxide, which is which you, you should not be breathing. Okay, so that's why it's dangerous. So don't do that at home, of course. Uh, the third thing that will kill you that so carbon dioxide will, if that's all you have to breathe, will will kill you within a few minutes. Okay, by then your your oxygen won't have your brain won't have enough oxygen, and you're going to become brain dead. Uh, the, the third thing if that didn't kill you would be the temperature. The temperature on Mars is super cold, minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit on average. So, you know, uh, if you stand on Mars, like just in your t-shirt and shorts, you stand on Mars and let's say the other two things didn't kill you. Well, by the end of the Martian day, which is 24 hours, which is roughly the Earth day as well, uh, you would be entirely frozen to the bone. Uh, you know, your body, you, you turn into a human popsicle. So that's not good. Uh, but that will take several hours to, to happen. And so, uh, you know, if you have to do a mad dash somehow uh, through very cold temperatures, you might be able to survive. Uh, the, the fourth thing that will kill you, if that didn't kill you, would be the dust. The Martian dust is actually really bad news. It's toxic. And, you know, it's not like we eat dust, but we if you're in a very dusty environment, you're going to ingest it no matter what. It's going to go into your lungs, into your nose, uh, actually into your mouth as well. And that's very bad because, you know, dust is not just dirty. It's, it's actually toxic on Mars. It, it contains chemical compounds that are, uh, that are basically, uh, that would make you sick. Uh, in particular, perchlorates and peroxides. And these two compounds are part of the reason why Mars is so rust, uh, essentially. And two of the compounds that are in part responsible for, for the rusting of Mars are these peroxides and perchlorates. Okay, so you don't want to be breathing in this dust that contains these toxic compounds. If you kept doing that, you're going to be dead in a few weeks. Uh, in the book, in the movie, The Martian, the astronaut is bringing in a lot of dirt from outside to grow potatoes. That's uh, actually uh, a bad idea because uh, he's going to be breathing, he or she is going to be breathing in all this uh, Martian dust and you don't want that. Okay. Finally, radiation from space. That's uh, high energy particles that are raining in from the sun, but also from deep space. Uh, the atmosphere on Earth, we're safe because there are two things that are protecting us. We have a thick atmosphere and the Earth has a magnetic field. So we're like on board Starship Enterprise where the shields are up and, you know, we are protected from space radiation. But if you're on Mars, there's no magnetic field to speak of. And uh, the atmosphere is so thin that it is also not going to protect you much from radiation. So you're going to be zapped by space radiation at the surface of Mars you need to protect yourself from that. But exposure to radiation will kill you immediately. You know, you will slowly become sick over the course of weeks to months, uh, and you might die of it only, you know, in a few years, uh, a few years afterwards. Uh, so it's actually a slow killer and not, not an immediate killer uh, radiation normally. All right, let's move on. Why would you go to Mars in the first place? Well, we want to find life and I'm not going to go into all these details here, but what we have on the left, this thing that looks like a giant bird, okay, is what's called the tree of life that connects us to all the animals, but also the plants, the cells, the bacteria, <clears throat> you know, the, the tiny little microscopic things we can't even see. Uh, anything that's living on earth is connected onto this tree because we all share some part of our uh, chemical makeup especially the, the DNA, uh, in other words, the, the sort of the nature's computer code, if you will, inside, inside our, our cells and our, our bodies. And this is not technically a DNA tree, it's a 16S RNA uh, tree, but it's the same idea. Uh, and what's remarkable is that 
what this tells you is that all life on Earth, every form of life that we know of, is connected genetically. In other words, you know, we, we're different from flowers and mushrooms and a squirrel and my dog <clears throat> because our DNA is different. And of course, the more difference we have, the more uh, unlike each other we are. But <clears throat> nevertheless, there's a common core. There are common parts of our DNA that are shared by, by all life forms. And this is telling us that we are probably the result of one origin of life very early in the Earth's history, that we all came, sprang from one source. And over time, uh, life evolved and diversified and gave rise to all these life forms that are around us today. Okay. And in case you can't find out where we are on this tree, we're right there at the bottom. It says, you are here. Okay. Homo is us. That's our species. In case you didn't know, <clears throat> you might enjoy knowing that we are uh, me members of the Epistoconta, okay, which is a, a grouping of somewhat more complex uh, animals and, and uh, sort of life forms. Uh, Epistoconta include human beings, but also you know, the animals that are common around us. Uh, all the way to mushrooms, fungi, to, to mushrooms, then we are basically to bacteria, uh, which is something that you might want to think about. Okay, but what we are, the reason why I'm showing you this tree of life is because we want to go to Mars because we think that we have a chance of finding a, the first example of alien life on Mars. And that would be, we don't expect to find an, a big animal or anything we could see, but even if it's a tiny little bug that you could only see with a microscope, uh, it was the first example of alien life that we could see or find. That would be an amazing thing. And to be alien means that you don't fit on the earth on Mars or what we want to do on Mars is not just find life on Mars. We were trying to look for and find the first example of alien life, something that would not map onto this tree that we see here on the left, which is our family tree here on earth. Okay, we want to find a weirdo that is so weird that it's going, to, it's going to be so different from even bacteria that we are going to be, we're going to look like cousins to bacteria once we find that thing, is sort of what we're saying. And so uh, we were searching, we don't know if there's life on Mars. And this is one of the main reasons why training and a little more training afterwards. Uh, to Mars to look for life. Now, where would you go to look for life? Well, on Earth, there's a big clue. Uh, on Earth, everywhere where there's liquid water that's somewhat clean, we have life in it. And all Earth life, everything that you saw on this tree just now, on the left, needs liquid water to survive. Even if you like the most uh, adapted desert survival creature you cannot do without liquid water at some point during the day or during during your week okay you you need some liquid water to survive and so some bugs actually can survive if they're trapped in ice for a long time they just you know shut down so to speak so they can survive for years even millennia and you can reactivate these bugs but for them to be active and eating and reproducing and behaving like life uh, normally does they have to be in contact with liquid water, okay? So this is why when we go to Mars, we are looking for places where there was once uh, liquid water or where there might be liquid water today, okay? So far, we've been focusing on places where there might have been liquid water in the past. And there are lots of places like this on Mars. Uh, here, we, we've know, we know that on Mars has been liquid water near the surface or at the surface of Mars, uh, you know, from pictures like this that take us all the way back to the earliest part of Mars's history, uh, we can see these ancient riverbeds. Okay, these actually we think now were carved by uh, water running, running underneath ancient ice sheets that you no longer see on Mars. But the point is there was liquid water that was carving out these, these, uh, these landscapes. And uh, these are places that we are wanting to go visit to see if they might have fossil life, forms of life that are from Mars 
that might be preserved in the rocks, dead now, but preserved in, in these ancient water, water rich places. Uh, water has been available near the surface of Mars throughout Martian history, not in large amounts. Most of the water on Mars is frozen, it's, it's a cold planet. But every now and then, even today, this is very recent now, okay, some of these gullies might even be forming as we speak. Uh, there's still some water, we think, that's somehow seeping out of the ground uh, or melting from occasional snow patches to, to form these little gullies that we see on the sides of, of, of hills. Okay. So we're going to want you to go check out places like this that might still have water today. Okay. That, that would be a very exciting place to go explore uh, in case you can find life there. Now, we've landed in about eight locations on Mars. And I should point out that the only uh, nation so far that has been able to survive a landing on Mars and, and actually do it very well is the United States. Many other countries have tried to land on Mars and they, they've not succeeded because it's difficult. It's a very big challenge to land on Mars. The United States has landed eight times successfully at the surface of Mars and uh, and this is the very first landing site that we reached, which was uh, landed on in 1976, the Viking One landing site. It's actually one of my favorite places in terms of sort of the, the beauty of the dirt on them. Sand is apparently blowing around. You know, it's, it just looks like uh, your backyard if you live in Utah or Arizona, okay? Minus the sagebrush. Uh, this is another uh, nice site, uh, the Mars Pathfinder site. And the Mars Pathfinder mission actually was uh, uh, a, solid, a lander that just landed in one location, but it was carrying a little rover the size of a skateboard called Sojourner. And the rover rolled off a ramp and started sniffing the rocks around. Uh, and eventually the, the mothership, the lander, died because dust covered its solar panels and so it could no longer power itself properly, which, which was planned and expected. Uh, but Sojourner, by bobbing around, was able to shake off the dust that it had on its solar panels. So for all we know, it's still going around in circles here uh, around the lander. And so if one day you get close to this landing site, uh, we hope that you can do a little detour to check out Mars Pathfinder and see if you can pick up Sojourner and bring it back to the, to the Smithsonian. Okay. All right. And then curiosity. Curiosity is like the big Rolls Royce that's uh, running around on Mars right now. It's uh, sniffing the rocks, studying the chemistry of Mars, trying to figure out how much water there was at this location in the past. It's a very complex and exciting mission. Uh, and right at this minute, it's, it's sort of starting to go up a hill inside a very large impact crater. And this hill is interesting because it's made up of layers that were apparently deposited on Mars over time in the past. And so we're trying to figure out what these layers are made of. Are they just uh, hardened sand? Are they you know, made of deposits that were somehow laid down in water? Uh, we were, we're seeing some very exciting things as we are going up this hill right now. But just last week, we've launched our next big rover to Mars. It's about the same size as Curiosity, it's Perseverance. And you can see Perseverance here, uh, and like Curiosity, it does not have solar panels. If you uh, observe, Sojourner had a little solar panel. It was small, so the solar panel didn't have to be very big. You can power a small rover like this with a small solar panel. But you can't power a big rover like this with solar panels because you would need very big solar panels. And the solar panels would be so big uh, to, to provide enough power that it, they, they would make the whole thing very flimsy to drive around in. So instead of at some point when you decide that you don't want to have solar panels anymore and you, uh, on board, they're, they're called RTGs, radioisotopic thermal generators. And so they, they have a, it's a little nuclear battery, if you will, uh, that's powering the rover and keeping things warm, uh, but also powering the instruments and allow, allowing it to drive. The, the cool thing uh, from my perspective about Perseverance, I mean, there's many cool things about it, but the, one of my favorite th things is that it's carrying for the first time something that's gonna fly on Mars. It's not an airplane, but it's a helicopter. 
It's a little drone helicopter, and you can see the picture there at the bottom right. Uh, the helicopter has a name as well. It's called Ingenuity. And Ingenuity right now is strapped to the bottom of the rover, and the rover is on its way to Mars. Uh, but once the rover starts driving on Mars, at some point, it's going to lower the helicopter onto the ground, drive away, and then once the rover is away, the helicopter is going to spin up and start flying around Mars. Okay? And it's going to take pictures of the Martian landscape, including of the rover in this beautiful landscape. So we're, we're, I'm very excited to see what this helicopter is going to show us. Uh, being able to fly will give you a very different perspective on you know, what the terrain is like. And it's going, to be, it's going to be really wonderful. It's going to be really wonderful. Now, the air on Mars is so thin okay, that in order to, to lift anything with you know, spinning blades like this, the blades have to spin really fast. On the Earth, you know, when you have a helicopter, uh, the Earth has a thick atmosphere. So the, the blades of your helicopter, even though they're spinning pretty fast, they don't have to spin that fast because there's a lot of air to whip around, so to speak, to, to allow you to, to generate lift and fly. But on Mars, the air is so thin that you really have to, to, to whip the air fast okay, with your little rotors to, to generate lift. So these little rotors are spinning at about 2,400 rounds per minute, okay? And each rotor, you see two rotors, there's a top one and a bottom one. These rotors are spinning in different directions, in opposite directions, that you know, the whole air spacecraft doesn't have to itself spin around. It, what the, the torque from one rotor is compensated by the torque produced by the other, okay? Uh, but there you go. We're gonna have the first flight of a helicopter probably a few weeks after uh, Perseverance lands on Mars. Now, Perseverance is carrying lots of instruments. I'm not going to go into all of these you know, details, but I just want to point out that it's got a super cam, which is a laser micro imager uh, that can see things at very high resolution. It, you have, it has a mass cam Z, which is a zoomable panoramic camera. It's going to return some unbelievable pictures of the landscape of Mars. Uh, there's something called the Sherlock instrument that's going to sniff the, the composition of rocks and it will even be able to relate it to, to life. It's able to detect organic molecules and, and chemicals. Okay? Uh, one of my favorite instruments is MOXIE. MOXIE is actually more like a test. Okay? MOXIE, the whole idea is that it's going to suck in Martian atmosphere which is made of CO2, carbon dioxide. It's going to squeeze the carbon dioxide, run it through um, an, 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 a machine that's called an electrolysis machine. Okay, it's a solid um, electrolysis machine. And on the other end, it's going to cough out oxygen. It's going to extract oxygen. It's going to basically rip this, the O2 out of the CO2. And so you, you put in, you suck in enough carbon dioxide, you can produce some oxygen, which is O2. And then you end up on the other end with, with CO2 and, and CO as sort of byproducts, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. But the whole idea here is to produce oxygen, O2, uh, through a machine by just sucking in Martian atmosphere. And the whole reason for doing this is because oxygen is so, it's going to be so important for us and for you when you go to Mars. You need oxygen to breathe. You can use oxygen as rocket fuel. Uh, you can use oxygen to, to power things. Uh, it, it's an incredible commodity to have oxygen, and it, but it's also very heavy to, tr to transport. So if you can make it on Mars, instead of having to have a giant rocket to get to Mars for you, uh, you're going to be much better off. So this experiment, MOXIE, is very important for the future of human exploration because we are wanting to make sure that you can produce oxygen on Mars. Okay, that's the end of phase one. Uh, by now, you know what Mars is like, why you're going there, uh, what to be careful about in terms of the dangers of Mars. Uh, let's get you ready for launch. So here's a map of some of the places where you might go train. They are places on Earth that are in one way or another uh, similar to Mars. I mean, they're all extreme environments. 
Some places are extremely dry, some places are extremely rocky and sandy. Other places are extremely cold, like Antarctica or the Arctic, okay? Hawaii is extremely pleasant. Well, uh, the real reason why I think Hawaii is interesting, of course, is because it's got giant volcanoes and there are volcanoes on Mars. And by going to Hawaii, you can actually practice exploring the volcanoes of Mars, okay? So one place that uh, you are likely to go train for your missions to Mars is this place where I go every summer uh, in the Arctic on Devon Island. It's all the way up, if you go north of the US, even past Alaska, straight up towards the North Pole, at some point you run into this place called Devon Island, uh, right to the left of Greenland. And Devon Island is the largest uninhabited island on Earth. Uh, it's about the size of West Virginia, and it's all to yourself when you're there. So it's a terrific place to train because, first of all, there's a giant meteorite crater on the island, just like the craters that you find on Mars. Uh, but also, uh, it's very rocky, very cold, very dry, and that's pretty much how you would describe Mars today uh, as well. Okay, so it's a very good training ground and a place to, to test things, but also to, to learn about the landscape of Mars. You have a base there. This is the little base where you're gonna go train. And once you're gonna be done with your training, once you know how to explore Mars, how to put on a spacesuit, what tools to use to explore at this location and a few others, we're gonna put you in a giant rocket. This is the big rocket that NASA is building right now to get humans uh, back to the moon, but also possibly on their way to Mars at, you know, at some point. Uh, it's called the SLS. It comes in two flavors, the small SLS and the big SLS, the big cargo SLS. The small SLS will be used to launch crew uh, to, to Earth orbit, usually. Uh, whereas the big SLS that you see here is going to send cargo and can send it all the way to Mars, okay? So when this rocket flies, it's gonna be uh, the most powerful rocket ever flown. I don't know what you have uh, you know, in your plans for mid to late 2021, so next year, the middle to, to, to fall of uh, flight test of the SLS rocket. It's called the Artemis One mission. There won't be any astronauts on board. It's a robotic test, so to speak, okay? but. It's gonna be spectacular. If it's successful, it will be spectacular. If, it, if it's not successful, it will be spectacular as well. Okay. All right, now <clears throat> to go on a mission to the moon, you need one giant rocket and then you can go off to the moon for, for your week, week long travel and be back. To go to Mars, the current plan, although there are lots of variants and how to make this tighter or cheaper or more luxurious, okay, but this is sort of a, an average plan. The, the current average plan is to have, is to use seven of these giant rockets for one mission to Mars, at least those. And well, first of all, you never really have them all lined up like this in Florida at the bottom left here. But uh, the first step is to launch four of these giant rockets, one after the other. But once they are in space around the earth, all the stuff that they are carrying with them gets assembled in two spaceships. And these are two spaceships without anybody on board. These are robotic spaceships. And these two spaceships are going to travel to Mars ahead of your own trip. Like they're gonna to go to Mars two to four years, maybe even six years ahead of time. And the reason why you wanna do this is because you're gonna to send to Mars ahead of time all the things that you don't wanna be traveling with, like the car that you will drive once you get to Mars or the habitat in which you will live once you land on Mars. Okay, you don't wanna be traveling to Mars with those things because what if they don't land in the right location once you get there? You know, and then now you are finding out only at the last minute that you won't have a rover or you won't have your habitat. That's not good. So you're gonna send all these things that you won't need until you are on Mars. You're gonna send all these things to Mars ahead of time, set up shop there, verify that they've landed all in good working condition and in the right place. And once you've verified that from the earth, you launch two more giant rockets and they're gonna to put together your spaceship. Uh, it's still empty at that point. 
And then on the seventh rocket, that's you. That's you and some fresh groceries. You board your spaceship. You're still around uh, the Earth here. You're in low Earth orbit. This is now your, your spaceship um, on, the, on the left, on the right. And it's got solar panels, but also nuclear power on board. This big uh, thing that looks like a marshmallow in the front uh, is essentially an astronaut bouncy house. It's an inflatable or an expandable habitat. So when you launch that thing in a rocket, it's sort of squeezed tight. But once it's in space, you let it expand and now you have a lot more room to live in. Uh, so we think we're gonna use an inflatable or an expandable habitat as part of the things we wanna to take to Mars. And then at the very front, you have the lander. That little pod there in the front is the is the the one part that will land on Mars once you get there. Uh, and then here, what I'm showing you with my arrow, this other pod is the only part that lands back on Earth, just like the Dragon capsule this week. This will be the only part that lands on the Earth at the very end of your mission when you're coming back from Mars. Okay, and you, you need to land on the Earth. So let's go to Mars, phase three of your training. I hope you're following so far. I'm uh, going as fast as I can, I think, but uh, you, you need to be um, on top of all this, okay? So let's go to Mars now. So Mars, as you know, is far away and it's gonna take some time to get there, even with a big rocket, okay? It, took, it will take uh, you know, three days to get to the moon. Well, Mars is not that, Mars, it will take you six months. That's a typical scenario. Six months to get to Mars. So you leave the Earth here. You, you cruise out to Mars and, and you meet Mars here. By the way, when you leave the Earth, when you leave the Earth at this point, Mars is not there yet. Mars is somewhere along here. Uh, and then by the time you get there, Mars basically shows up. And so you have to time it all right, okay? You don't wanna show up here and Mars is not there yet. Okay, so, so six months to get out there. And then once you are, you've arrived at Mars, whether you land or whether you just stay around Mars, uh, you have to essentially stay near Mars for 18 months before you can, before the Earth and Mars reposition themselves basically for you to fly back to the Earth cheaply. And so, hey, 18 months, that's a year and a half. Okay, so you might be on Mars for a year and a half before you fly back. And it's another six months when you fly back to the Earth. So all in all, you're gone six months plus 18 months plus six months. That's 30 months, 900 days. That's two and a half years, okay? So I don't know about if everybody's still on board, but you're going to a place that's a up to a thousand times farther away from the, from the earth than the moon is. And you're gonna be gone from home for two and a half years, okay? So kids, uh, imagine that two and a half years without parental supervision, okay? Can you survive this? Okay, I digress. Uh, life on board your Mars ship. Well, by the way, in all in all, you're gonna spend a year in this spaceship, between like six months out, six months back, you're gonna spend one year in that spaceship that I just showed you. Okay, so here's the inside of that spaceship. I don't have time to go into all the details. I'll just talk about the astronaut bouncy house here. Uh, if you notice, first of all, there's no gravity. So you are weightless. There are people sleeping upside down. This guy's on a treadmill sideways. She's in the kitchen or I'm not sure what she's doing. Um, this person is floating through a corridor through the service module. This person is checking out the earth return vehicle. And I think there's somebody checking out spacesuits in the Mars lander. Uh, but basically, you are. This is a mission where you have seven people in this particular uh, scenario, and I want to point out is this: you see these these uh, sandbags that are sort of they are bags containing food and water, and the idea here is to use the fact that food and water contain hydrogen. This, this compound called hydrogen. As you know, water is H2O, so that H is hydrogen, but food also has hydrogen, you know, carbohydrates, for example. So uh, hydrogen is in food and water, and uh, hydrogen is good because it helps protect you from space 
creation. At least it does a bit of a job. And you want that. When you're in deep space, there's no magnetic field around you unless you create one, which is very difficult. Uh, there's no atmosphere, really, that's thick enough to protect you from space radiation. So you have to sort of shield yourself as much as you can from you know, the background radiation of space. And so food and water are a good way to, to surround yourself with a shell of hydrogen, if you will, uh, to stay safe. Now, there, there are two things you need to know about this. If you're thirsty, you're gonna drink some water out of one of these bags. And then at some point you're gonna need to go to the bathroom. So you go to the bathroom and your urine also known as P, will get piped into the service module where it gets cleaned up, filtered, purified, and recirculated to refill one of these water bags. Because there's no way you can send uh, a year's worth of water to Mars and back for seven people and have them have fresh, untouched water each time they use water, okay, for washing, for drinking. That would be too much water. You can only take so much and you're going to recycle it. You're gonna to plan to recycle it so that you don't have to take fresh water for everybody every day, every minute. And so basically while you, you, you might leave the earth with you know, fresh water in every bag, but within a few weeks of flying to Mars, you're gonna be drinking uh, yours and each other's uh, recycled pee and sweat, by the way. So that's, that's actually the good news. Uh, the bad news, the bad news is of course food. Food we cannot recycle. So you grab a bag of food and there's actually a silver lining there. You can tell NASA what you like to eat. You know, I love sushi. So I might have freeze dried sushi if I go to Mars. Okay. Uh, but you can, you can tell NASA what, you, what, what your favorite food is and they'll probably accommodate you. Uh, but it all ends the same way. You at some point have to go to the bathroom. And now what do you do with the poop? Well, you can't send it through the machinery and recycle it. That's that we just don't have a plan for that. Uh, it's very complicated to do. NASA's tried. Uh, there are some possibilities that it might be possible in the future. We're working on it, but uh, it, it doesn't, it's not looking good in more ways than one. So, uh, what are you going to do with the poop? Well, you can't just open a window and toss it out into space. Uh, and I mean, here I'm talking about poop on your way to Mars, but you, you can't just open the window and toss it out into space. You, you also, you know, can't, um, can't recycle it. So what do you do with it? Well, you have to save it actually, because uh, you have to remember that what the food was providing you with was, was hydrogen to protect you from radiation as well, not just nutrients. Now that all you have is poop, it is still rich in hydrogen. You still need a protection from radiation. And so what you have to do is collect your poop into a bag, like a Ziploc bag, okay? Uh, emphasis on lock. And that bag goes back on the wall where you, you, you took your food bag in the first place to, to patch up the hole in radiation shielding, okay? And you have to do this very methodically so that, you know, of course, when you first leave the Earth, you're surrounded by fresh food. But by the time you're coming back from Mars after a year in space, you're surrounded by mostly your and everybody else's poop bag, poop bags for, you know, a year's worth of it. Uh, and you will be left with very few food bags, food bags. Okay, so uh, I recommend very careful uh, labeling. All right, let's move on. So the big day arrives, you get to Mars, and one of the first things you might explore actually are the moons of Mars. Mars has two tiny little moons, much smaller than our own moon, Phobos, which is really close to Mars, uh, almost as close as shown here, uh, whereas Deimos is actually pretty far out, okay, significantly farther out. And Phobos and Deimos are very intriguing places, and Deimos is a bit smaller than Phobos, but they're both very small. And this is what Mars might look like if you were exploring the surface of Deimos, the outer moon. Uh, so, you know, these bodies are so small, there's, there's very little gravity on them. So you can't really walk on these places. You'd be, you'd be you know, jetpacking around probably with these uh, like, you know, flying armchairs for, for astronauts. So 
So that's how you might explore Deimos. And then the exploration of Phobos would be the same thing. You, the gravity is still too low for you to walk around. So you might need to even anchor yourself the best you can to sort of stay stable anywhere uh, and, then, and then do some work or collect a sample, okay? Uh, but this is just to show, this slide here is a bit busy, but you don't have to read everything. On the left, I'm showing you astronaut John Young, who was on the Apollo 16 mission. And astronaut John Young, and he was on actually many other missions as well, but this is on the Apollo 16 mission, this picture. <clears throat> and he was demonstrating here how high you can jump on the moon. So he just pushed himself off his feet. And in spite of the fact that he was wearing a 250 pound spacesuit, uh, he was able to jump one and a half feet, basically above, uh, above ground. Uh, now that's because the moon is still pretty big and you are still you know, weighing something significant on the moon. Uh, if you were on Phobos, this is how high with the same push on your legs, you would be able to jump. So what I have here on the bottom here is an astronaut. So imagine John Young, okay, uh, is this size. Well, with the same push that he, that he did on them to get himself one and a half feet above the moon here by jumping, he would basically jump uh, 440 feet uh, into the air, so to speak, above Phobos. Okay, there's no air, but he would be able to jump 440 feet, so 134 meters. Uh, the whole round trip would last about seven minutes. I mean, it would take him three minutes and three and a half minutes to, to rise all the way. Like he pushes himself, he's going to take three and a half minutes to rise all the way up there. And of course, the higher he gets, the slower he's traveling. And then at some point, he's going to stop, and then he's going to start falling back down. And that's going to take another three and a half minutes to come back down. Okay, and then he's going to land in his, on his feet. If he can, he might, you better not tumble, uh, but he might land on his feet, but no harder than when he pushed himself off. Okay, so this is how much fun it would be to sort of do some high jumping on Phobos. And, and it's even worse on Deimos. You could jump even higher on Deimos. That's a Statue of Liberty uh, just for scale here. It's, it's not on Phobos, of course, it's in New York. I just thought I'd specify this. Um, okay, phase four, gear up for survival, okay? So you've traveled to Mars, you're pretty much there, and now we're gonna train you to survive at the surface and to use all the gear that's gonna allow you to, to go exploring. So, I didn't reproduce every page of uh, our children's book, Mission Mars, uh, in part because I think my editor, Mona Chang, who was actually the originator of the idea of this children's book and uh, led the team that put this book together, uh, Mona might be watching, so I can't show every page of my children's book. So this is a, an original little sketch that I did for the entry sequence. Uh, but anyway, you would get to Mars, this whole spaceship stays in orbit around Mars, and all seven of you cram into the Mars lander, and then you enter the Martian atmosphere. And you're gonna, it's gonna heat up, there might be a blackout a minute or two, and then eventually you are in thicker atmosphere, you're gonna pop some parachutes. Uh, and these scenarios, by the way, change. I mean, if the thing is too big, then you can't have parachutes at all, and you're just gonna have to use rockets all the way down to the, to the surface. But anyway, you, uh, at some point, slow down enough, you, you get rid of the parachutes, and now you're dropping like a rock for a few seconds. You jettison the heat shield as well. And then you, just before crashing into the surface, of course, you fire up your rocket engines to cushion your landing, and now you've landed on Mars. And hopefully, hopefully, if you are lucky, uh, you have landed within walking distance of all that stuff, if you remember that you sent to Mars two to three years ahead of time. So, you know, this is it. Your habitat that you can live in, the rover that's now parked next to it, okay? This is, this is where you would want to, so you want to land within walking distance of this. Of course, don't forget the keys. Uh, inside, this is what it might look like. Uh, at the, in the upper deck, you have bedrooms, the control center. The upper level is the clean room level. It's, it's the cleanest part. It's where you sleep at night, where you want to sort of breathe clean air, where you have 
uh, your control center with all the electronics and the computers. And then you have the mid deck. In the mid deck, you've got, you know, more, slightly more dirt grit. You've got the bathrooms, the showers, uh, the hospital, because you might want to isolate a person from everybody else. Uh, you also have a lounge where you can eat. Okay, so that's, that's the mid deck. And then the lower deck is the cruddy deck. It's where you have the garage, uh, you know, where you might have your rock lab to study and, and analyze rocks that you've collected on Mars, where you might even have a bio lab to look for life uh, that you might have picked up on Mars. So uh, the, the lower deck is the interface uh, with the outside world on Mars, okay? And so you can drive out of the garage on your ATV or walk through this uh, little, um, little gate uh, as like in an airport all the way to, to your pressurized rover, okay, that's parked out there. Now, let's talk about the spacesuit you're gonna wear. This is not the spacesuit you're gonna wear, but this is the best spacesuit we have right now. It's called the EMU Extra Vehicle mobility unit. Uh, let me read that. The extra vehicular EVA, that means spacewalking, mobility unit. Okay, so the EMU uh, is a beautiful piece of, of uh, you know, aerospace engineering, really. You have to realize a spacesuit is not just clothing. It's, it's a wearable spacecraft. Okay, so it's got electronics, it's got radios, it's got lighting, it's got a whole life support system inside. It's like a space car. It's keeping you alive in there. Uh, it has ways to collect your waste. You know, if you need to go to the bathroom during a spacewalk, you, you can't just rush back in. You've got to do it inside your suit. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated piece of machinery. Uh, but as beautiful as the spacesuit is, it's not designed to walk on a planet or the moon, which is why you don't even have joints around the knees, etc. Uh, and also it weighs too much. It weighs about 300 pounds on the earth. And so if you took it to the moon, even though it's not designed for walking, at least you, you might be able to do something with it because on the moon, 300 pounds divided by six is 50 pounds. 50 pounds would be the felt weight of your spacesuit, of the spacesuit on the moon. It's kind of manageable. It's like a heavy backpack if you go camping. Uh, you could probably bend down and pick up rocks and, and do your work. But if you take the same spacesuit to Mars where gravity is 38% of what it is on the Earth, uh, this spacesuit would have a felt weight on Mars of 125 pounds. Okay, so that is way too heavy for you to be, you know, a, an explorer, really. You, you just be, you, you just feel like you, you had a big meal, basically, uh, on Mars. And, and so you'd be too heavy to walk around. And you will not be an effective explorer. So we have to, the big challenge we face is to cut the mass. In other words, we wanna rethink the engineering of the suit to reduce how much it weighs. We wanna cut the mass of the suit in half, okay, roughly, uh, so that uh, a 120 pound suit on, Mar on, on Mars right now would weigh only 60 pounds, okay? So, so it's not easy to do. Where are you going to trim? Where are you going to, where are you going to shave off? Okay, 50% of the mass of this thing that is already so lean and mean. Uh, so it's a big challenge. If some of you are uh, wondering if you want to go into aerospace engineering or you know what, what would be exciting to do, I personally find that designing spacesuits is the most exciting thing to do. Okay, because you you have to be uh, you know uh, an aerospace engineer. A, a biologist, basically, you have to understand human physiology, uh, but you also have to do things like tailoring. Okay, uh, the the best sewers that I've ever seen, people who can do sewing, are you know middle-aged spacesuit engineers um, from the spacesuit company, uh, Collins Aerospace. So my point is. Uh, it's a it's a multiple skill type of uh, aerospace industry and 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 engineering and it's it's really wonderful. So we face a big challenge. We got to cut the mass of this thing in half. This is what the Mars suit might end up looking like: uh, big boots for rock and soils, these gaiters that you might zip on and off to protect your lower legs so that sharp rocks won't scrape and puncture your spacesuit. 
remember the space suit is inflated from the inside. Okay, so you you're like in some sort of a balloon all the time. Uh, the upper torso, meaning the part that's above the waist, is actually hard in this particular design. So it's like a turtle shell, uh, and and of course, the way you enter the spacesuit and get out of it is actually through the backpack. The backpack swings open like a refrigerator door, and you, you go in leg first, legs first. You let your, your feet go all the way down to the boots. Then you insert your arms. Then somebody or you, you press a button, and your backpack closes behind you. And now you're sealed inside this, this uh, body-shaped spacecraft, and, and you are ready for your spacewalk. So I'm going to show you here in this quick little clip um, how what it will be like, what it would look like to walk and run on Mars. So of course you will feel light even if you're walking on Mars, but the way you walk um, might not look very different from the way you walk on the Earth. I mean, you you might do a little bit of a bunny hop to be more efficient. Okay, just a bit like the astronauts on the Moon. But you, you you sort of could could almost walk like you do on the Earth, okay. But if you start running, and had a suit that was as flexible as this one, which you might not have actually, but if you start running, this is these are the leaps that you could do, okay. This is the gait that you would have. So so far it it's, doesn't look impressive yet, but just give this a few seconds. So the way you simulate Martian gravity in this case here is to hang a person sideways so that the full weight of their body doesn't you know, weigh down on the ground, only part of it weighs down. And so you, the angle will, will allow you to match Martian gravity, okay, the angle of this, of this slope that they're on. So this is what it will be like to run on Mars. Okay? Let's say you're inside a gym on Mars. This is what you would be able to do. That'd be a lot of fun. Okay. So another thing to be aware of are dust storms. Dust storms sometimes just means that you're going to have a bit of, you know, fogginess in the atmosphere, but it could also be a major dust storm where you wouldn't be able to, to see, you know, past your, your habitat or your rover. Uh, so you have to be aware of these dust storms. They can show up and, run across the Martian surface pretty quickly. Uh, so this is a dust storm seen on Mars from, from space. Uh, this is a painting uh, that shows you what a dust storm might look like if it was about to engulf a little, you know, human landing site here in the foreground. Uh, so we're trying to design spacesuits that will allow us not just to, to explore Mars, but to allow us to survive things like dust storms. And uh, this is a simulation. I'm, I'm actually inside the suit here. Uh, this is a simulation where uh, I was in a simulated Martian dust devil. And, you know, we're obviously not on Mars. So to simulate Martian dust used volcanic ash from Hawaii, uh, but also some of the fact that with the lesser gravity on Mars, the dust would sort of uh, float around a little more. Okay. So anyway, here are some tests that are being done. And you can see that when the dust grain hits the fabric of your spacesuit, which is shown here in the microscopic uh, view here in black and white, the, the particles of dust will actually ding the fabric of the suit. So over time, you could really you know, create a, a, weak, a weak point in your suit. And that's not, that's not good. So we got to work on that. So here's the good news. Perseverance is actually carrying for the first time a little pallet on its front. It's between the, the two front wheels. In fact, you can see it there on, on Perseverance. And this little pallet, instead of having like watercolor paint patches, it has spacesuit fabric samples. Okay, and to sort of help the, some of the science instruments test themselves. But here's a list of the five spacesuit fabrics uh, that are going to be tested in the Martian environment for the first time. And so we want to see over the course of the life of this rover, you know, whether or not the dust on Mars will end up wearing down on these, on these materials or corrode them somehow. 
uh, it's going to be uh, this is a this is an experiment that you should care about tracking because it will it will ultimately tell you what your space is going to be looking like and, and made of. Okay, I should point out that one of these little sample holders on the pallet, and that's not for the purpose of testing the space unit anymore. It has it's it's for training an instrument, making sure that it works well. Now, one of these sample one of these sample holders contains a Martian meteorite, okay, <laughs> a piece of Mars. So this is a piece of rock that left Mars. Uh, you know, a long time ago when an asteroid or comet hit Mars, it drifted through space, it landed on Earth, eventually got picked up by geologists who, who recognized that it was from Mars. And now it is going to be do, uh, it's, it's gonna go back on a trip to Mars, okay, on Perseverance. It's the first time that something does a round trip between the Earth and Mars, very cool. Okay, to get around, you need a rover, on the moon, we had one. This was the buggy that the Apollo, the Apollo astronauts had. In fact, the first time this was tested was basically last week, 49 years ago. Okay, So uh, we are celebrating the anniversary of this mission, Apollo 15, which was the first of the, the three last Apollo landings that had a rover uh, on them. On, yep. And uh, this particular buggy was an electric rover, okay, so just like electric cars around us uh, in some sense, but uh, it was not built by any of our car manufacturers. It was actually built by Boeing, uh, so Boeing was contracted to, to, to build the lunar rover, okay. Now, this was, I think, fine for the short stays we had on the moon. You wanted the astronauts to stay together, not drive too far. It was all good. But really, for maximum flexibility and exploration, you, you want to have each your own. And so for Mars, we're thinking, and possibly even for the moon when we go back now, we, we're thinking that each astronaut should have their own ATV. And it might end up being something that's bigger than that, you know, more comfortable, more, more safe, more stable as well. Uh, but the idea of each astronaut having their own ATV is, is coming from our project in the Arctic where we're doing this... Uh, where we hope to one day train astronauts, but where we're doing research right now. And so the, the ATV idea is more than just a way to, to get you around. The idea actually is to offload some of the heavy stuff in your spacesuit. Remember, we're trying desperately to cut the mass of your spacesuit down. So the idea is to offload things like things that are heavy, like big batteries and big oxygen tanks. We want to offload those onto the ATV so that you keep in your backpack only a very small battery and a very small oxygen tank. And then meanwhile, your ATV is like a robot that follows you when you're not riding it. So let's say you see an interesting rock, you unbuckle, you step off, you pick up the rock, you go examine it. If you walk away, the ATV will follow you like a, you know, like a dog. And that's no longer a mystery, self-driving cars that can you know, follow you. There are people who now have suitcases that follow them at airports, okay? so. Uh, this is sort of the same idea, uh, but this way you don't have to be lugging around these big oxygen tanks and big batteries in your backpack. You can, you can put some of this stuff on the ATV uh, and, and, be, and have a lighter spacesuit, therefore. Okay. So this is an ATV, of course, that you'd be able to, to talk to. It's a smart rover. Okay. So already on Devon, I, this is my dog and me. Uh, this particular dog actually passed away, King Kong, he passed away. So now I have Apollo, but this was at the end of one of these uh, spacesuit ATV tests uh, on Devon Island. Uh, and so we're, we're sort of working, we're thinking through how, what you need to do to connect and disconnect your spacesuit to, to an ATV supply of oxygen and, and electricity. Okay. Now for longer road trips, you don't want to be just in a spacesuit riding an ATV. That's good for, you know, close range, little outings. If you want to go on a little road trip, you want a pressurized rover. So that's like a motor home. You don't have to be in a space all the time. You're in, when you're inside, you're you know, like in shirt sleeves. And uh, you, I was actually privileged to, to test drive this thing called the Space Exploration Vehicle. At the time, it was called the Lunar Exploration Rover. And uh, it's an amazing machine developed at NASA's Johnson Space Center mainly, but uh, there are actually two separate parts. The chassis, 
with the you know six double wheels, uh, which the wheels can configure themselves in, independently so that they can, for example, turn into a circle formation. And you can turn right on the spot, not make a U-turn, literally spin around the middle axis there of your of your rover and get out of this uh, location if you if you you know didn't have room to make a U-turn or 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 you know change directions otherwise. Uh, and then you have the cabin on top, which is pressurized. Uh, well, in this case, it wasn't. It's just a, a concept vehicle. But on Mars or on the moon, it would be pressurized. So you would have air inside. And, and therefore, you don't have to be wearing a spacesuit when you're inside. It's actually very user friendly. If you're right handed, you sit on the right. If you're left handed, you sit on the left. You drive it by using the joystick that you can see. Uh, it's to go forward, you push the joystick forward. To go backwards, you pull. To do a spin right on the spot, you you twist the joystick. Uh, this is when all these hours of video gaming might actually pay off. Okay. Now, uh, let's say you explore a location during the day. You put on your spacesuit. You go outside. You collect rocks. Uh, you might even hop onto a robotic ATV to do this, and then you come back to your rover. Uh, you know, at the end of your day, you you climb back inside. And you cook dinner, you write, you send some messages back home, and then you go to bed. And then while you're sleeping, the rover, maybe as a robot in robot mode or remote control from the Earth, will drive you to the next location that you will explore in the morning. So you might you know, end up at the edge of a canyon in the morning or something like that. Now, the cool part of the design of this rover is the fact that it's set up in such a way that you never enter the rover with your spacesuit, which is really good because your spacesuit is going to be covered with dust. And you remember that Martian dust is toxic. So you don't want to be going in and out of your rover just wearing a spacesuit, which, which is what you see in pretty much every science fiction movie about Mars. Okay, you, you see an astronaut wearing a spacesuit climbing in and out of where they live inside the rover or inside the habitat. That is a very bad idea and design. You, you want to separate as much as possible your spacesuit from where you're living. Uh, space is gonna be full of grit and covered in toxic dust. So this is the interface that I've come up with and is still uh, perfecting, which is called a spacesuit at the back of your rover in this case. And if you remember, you climb in and out of your spacesuit through the backpack that opens like a refrigerator door. So this door just opens now into the rover and you can go directly from the inside of the rover into your spacesuit through this partition, if you will. Uh, and, and then off you go. Your spacesuit never enters and brings in the dust into, into the rover, okay? And of course, there's a double door system. There's a door that stays with your backpack when you walk off and there's a door that stays with the rover to seal off that you know, gaping hole once you're, once you're not there anymore with your spacesuit. So this is uh, astronaut Rex Walheim demonstrating how you can climb in and out of your spacesuit from the inside of the rover. You've got this bar that you can pull, you know, do chin up, ch chins up on. And you might think, well, that's kind of you know, awkward to climb in or out of your rover like this. But no, you remember you're in Martian gravity. So you will, you will actually be able to lift your whole body probably with just, you know, one finger, uh, maybe not, like a hand, okay? And so it will be easy to slide, to slip in and out of your spacesuit uh, in Martian gravity. So this is what it might look like, okay? The cockpit in the front, the galley somewhere in there in the middle where you cook, and then bunk beds for the astronauts on one side. You can decide who's going to take the top bunk or the bottom bunk. I'm going for the bottom bunk because it's got the window. Uh, and then at the back, you have the suit ports that give you access to the spacesuits. You can see those little black rectangles and is uh, behind a red curtain there. And I want to actually mention here that, you know, all these beautiful uh, graphics and uh, artwork in my book were actually not done by me, but by a very talented uh, graphic and professional graphic designer called uh, Ryan Hobson. And Ryan Hobson actually has passed away, uh, but he created some really beautiful uh, and very, <clears throat> very understandable 
and very uh, informative graphics uh, for for Mission Mars. So I'm very happy we we had his um, his contribution to to, to this book. Um, if you notice, uh, we also have robotic arms in the front, and you can put your head into that bubble there, that glass bubble, lying down, you know, on the on the floor of the rover. And, and then use the arms. So you might be moving your own arms and then the robotic arms would mimic what you're doing and allow you to collect rock samples without having to go out on a spacewalk every time you see something interesting. Now to, to sort of learn how to use a rover and live inside and you know, manage your space and figure out what types of equipment you might want in there, uh, we are doing some tests and learning to do this with Humvees especially modified Humvees that are, and, and other vehicles, but this is an example. So this is a, a Humvee that is a ambu military ambulance version Humvee. It's got bunk beds in the back, uh, but of course it's been modified to serve as our you know, mobile field lab uh, to do this kind of, of study uh, on Devon Island. And in fact, we have two of them on Devon Island and you might think, well, how do we get them there since there's, it's an uninhabited island with no major airport. Yeah, how do you get a Humvee there? Well, we actually drove them on sea ice in the winter. Okay, where's an airport? So uh, this second rover that we have, the yellow one, the first one was red, yellow one, we had an epic journey to get it to Devon Island. I mean, it took uh, like essentially three years to get it to camp, three seasons. Uh, and this journey is captured uh, in a documentary film called Passage to Mars, which if you don't have anything better to do, you can you can watch on, I think Amazon or Hulu, okay, or wherever. Uh, but it's uh, it's actually a, a pretty atmospheric movie. It's slow paced and all that, but it's quite realistic in terms of the ambiance that you might have inside a, a rover on a on a road trip on Mars. Of course, we're not on Mars; we're in the Arctic, uh, so you know it's not. It's, it wasn't even a simulation. We, we just had to get the rover from down south to, to Devon Island, but it, it was a relevant experience. And so we, we've learned some lessons that are important for, for planning road trips on Mars in the future. Okay, Phase five, let me keep going. Uh, exploring the red planet. Well, there's a lot of real estate to explore. Mars has as much ground as all the continents of the earth put together. So, you know, you have no shortage of places to go and go check out. Uh, one of my favorite places is Valles Marineris Canyon. It's a gigantic canyon system that runs the width or length of the United States, the, the continental United States, uh, minus Alaska, uh, the conterminous United States. And uh, this canyon is up to eight kilometers deep in some locations. So that's roughly, you know, five and a half to six miles. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredibly, I mean, it's, it's a spectacular uh, um, a gaping hole, so to speak, uh, feature in the Martian landscape. Uh, its origin is not very well understood. We think it's the crust of Mars that has partly, you know, cracked open essentially, uh, but it might have also experienced glacial widening and glacial episodes. There might have been water in it at some point. Uh, so it's a it's a marvel, but also a mystery, and we really need to go check it out. Uh, and so there might be some rock climbing to do it at some point uh, for future Mars explorers. Okay. Uh, another favorite destination of mine, and I would recommend this place if you were going to Mars, uh, is Olympus Mons, the tallest mountain in the solar system, uh, the largest or second largest volcano on Mars. And at the bottom here, you see uh, how this, why this volcano is called a, a shield volcano. It's, it's shaped like a Roman shield. Okay, it spans the entire bottom there of this, uh, this image at the bottom. But look at how tall it is compared to even Mount Everest. Mount Everest is, you know, about 8.8 .8 kilometers tall, 8.7. Uh, Olympus Mons is, is essentially 22 kilometers above its base. It's, uh, it's an amazing uh, pile of light. Like other giant volcanoes in the vicinity of Olympus Mons, uh, there are pits and you know entrances to what are probably lava tubes on the flanks of these volcanoes. So big tunnel-shaped caves, basically, 
underneath the surface of the volcano. Uh, so this is actually one of my favorite destinations. It's, it's not Olympus Mons, it's, uh, it's near uh, Arcia Mons. Uh, but uh, I call these the, the twin pits. And look at the size of these pits compared to, you know, the Empire State Building. Okay. Uh, they are, you know, big holes. So be careful when you drive and fall into one of these. Uh, just uh, FYI. Uh, and here's another pit. This one actually on Arcia Mons itself called Jean or, or Jean. Uh, it's a uh, it's about 150 meters across, and as far as we know, it's at least 175 meters deep. Okay, so it's it's one of those things where, in this case, we can't even see the bottom when you uh, optimize the lighting on the images that we have and, and are tr trying to see some feature at the bottom of the, of these of this. So this is this is what I'm calling the bottomless pit on Mars. Uh, it's it's, it's deeper than it's wide, okay, if you can imagine that. And, um, and the, the next thing here is a painting that I did trying to sort of imagine what it might be like to, to descend into the Jean Pit uh, and, and maybe even finding life there, you know, shielded from radiation, uh, maybe benefiting from a bit of warmth from the volcano. The volcanoes on Mars are not necessarily dead, they might still be. Uh, and, uh, it would be an amazing thing to to one day go into you know inside the volcanoes of Mars, and of course a lot of people will say this is far fetched and you know we're not we're not about to do this or we might never do this. First of all, I would I would caution anybody with using the word never. It's a very dangerous word. Uh, you know things do happen eventually, uh, but yes, this is not something we would do immediately. We would probably send robots in first, etc. But uh, at some point, if we find something interesting in these caves, uh, we, we might want to send people, okay. Uh, another way to access the, the deeper parts of Mars, because see the surface of Mars we think right now might be too hostile for any form of life uh, that we, we can imagine for now. Uh, and so one way to, to increase our chances of finding life on Mars might be to go deeper where it's warmer and where at some point, you know, past the frozen ground, you will, you will run into liquid water. Uh, and so that could be in the volcanoes at very shallow depth, but otherwise elsewhere on Mars, you know, somewhere between two and five kilometers of depth. Okay. And again, that seems far-fetched to imagine drilling that deep on Mars, but of course we commonly do that in the oil industry here on earth. And there are some techniques that we might be able to use that, that, that might stand a chance of working on Mars for this uh, sometime in the future. So this is it, the final phase, and you're almost done with your training. Uh, in the world, you got to have a plan, not just going there and coming back and planting the flag and saying goodbye. You want to set up shop. The painting shows you an astronaut who's sort of enjoying the view of, uh, of a, a base that's about to, that just got started. And there's even a, a, a SpaceX a starship there landed on, you know, on the other side of this hill. You want to land your spaceships, your, your starships sort of not immediately where you're living because the, the, the rocket blast, the sand blast that you would get from the rocket taking off and landing would, would be very dangerous actually. So you want your landing pad to be sort of on the other side of a hill like this to deflect the, the, the gravel and dust that would be kicked up by, by a rocket launch or landing. Uh, once eventually the base will grow, you know, we might be doing some drilling. You see a drill tower there on the left. Uh, you might have some airships flying around on Mars, which would be a lot of fun. Uh, and you, we will be roaming around the whole planet from, you know, a few bases maybe. And then eventually, uh, there might be even tourists visiting your research base, just like we do in Antarctica. And there might even be a hotel, a place for you to stay in a, and your base, if it becomes big enough, you might wanna put it under a dome and just make the whole place uh, breathable and livable. Uh, so that these are things that I think are, are plausible uh, you know, within the century. Now, of course, there are dreams of doing more. Uh, some people are thinking of terraforming Mars, which means to transform Mars into another earth, essentially. And that sounds good on paper, 
uh, but it's actually really hard to do, and it would take a long, long time to do, and it would be very expensive. Okay, so as in, as in, essentially, pretty much unaffordable. But said that, uh, never say never, right? Uh, but it's going to take a while before this happens. It ever does. And, and, you know, the goal of Terra, a Disney resort uh, of sorts. So this is, this is sort of what's portrayed here. And right now we're in the red Mars phase. Okay. The planet is still a hostile place. We're, we're, we're talking about setting up a little base. Uh, but eventually if you thicken the atmosphere, for example, by releasing some of the CO2 and water vapor that's trapped the poles of Mars, uh, you might be able to, to warm up the surface. Okay. It could get to the point where, Things like moss could, could start growing because you know they can live in CO2 and they don't need a lot of oxygen. Uh, and then and then over time, again, we're talking unfortunately centuries here. Okay, you might end up with a place where you could actually uh, go without a spacesuit, where you have enough air in the Martian atmosphere that your blood won't boil. You don't need a spacesuit. You're still going to need an oxygen mass though because it's going to be very hard to fill the Martian atmosphere with oxygen. So with a thicker atmosphere, you'd be a thicker atmosphere of CO2, but to have oxygen thick enough for you to just breathe without, without a breathing mask, that's gonna be a very, very long time, okay? But uh, hey, I don't know about you, but we're all wearing masks and I think it's not that big of a deal. So this is it. Uh, sorry, this might've run a little long but you have now completed your training if you're still listening. And I wanna just use this uh, last painting as my parting shot. Um, this is the painting that uh, we'll be giving out to you know, 50 of you who signed up for it first. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll put your first name on the blank name tag and, and sign the print and get it to Chabot. And hopefully you'll, you'll uh, enjoy this. Uh, but more importantly, there, there's going to be somebody in this suit someday soon on Mars. And I hope it's going to be one of you. Uh, if it is, by the way, uh, make sure you take this picture with you uh, and bring it back. But what I, more seriously, uh, what you should remember is it's going to take hard work to, to make this happen. And I often, I actually have in my little book here, uh, the... The uh, five qualities that are important to have for an astronaut, I think, to, to go on any expedition like this to Mars, number one is to be very knowledgeable. Okay, so you have to learn a lot of things, especially in school, but even outside school, any, anytime you can keep learning. Uh, number two, you have to be healthy physically and, and also maintain uh, mental health if you, if you can. Uh, the third thing is that you really have to be very motivated to go, okay? It's not just raising your hand and say, hey, I want to go to Mars. You're going to have to commit many years of your life training for this mission, um, and it might not happen for you. You know, many astronauts uh, could have gone to the moon, but ended up not going uh, because you know the plans changed and they didn't get a chance to go. Uh, the fourth thing is that you have to be always very adaptable. So that actually is a secret of success of being successful in any expedition. You know, you, you can't go into an expedition and say, "Well, something is happening," and you didn't sign up for that because you know you thought things would be different. Well, no. You know, a disaster can happen during an expedition and you have to face the, the reality of that and adapt to the situation. So small things, big things can happen and you have to always be very flexible, okay? Be, be very flexible, be very adaptable. And then finally, you have to be a very good team player, all right? So uh, the, going on a trip to Mars cooped up with seven people is not something for, for somebody who would be selfish uh, it, it's the thing that, you know, you have to treat your crewmates like they're your family or even better. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, look after each other because that's all you have essentially to help you if, uh, if something were to happen on Mars or on the way there and back. Okay. So that's it. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for taking us on that journey. Um, we really appreciate your time. And um, it's amazing to see all the different phases um, that it takes just to get ready to go to Mars. Then once you're in Mars, I think it was very enlightening, you know, to see those images of what it could look like. 
Um, so thank you so much for, for all of that. Um, it's really enlightening and very exciting to see what the future holds uh, for Mars exploration. Um, we did have a few questions that came in during your talk, so I thought we could um, jump in at ask a few of those um, during this time. Um, one of the questions that came in was, is there a height requirement to go to Mars? So someone was 5'2", and we're wondering if they would be able to go. Not right now. Uh, not right now. But uh, usually the smaller you are, the better, um, just because you, you, know, you weigh less. And we are mass constrained on a trip to Mars. But I think the way we will be going to Mars will actually allow people of any height to go, any size, uh, I mean, within reason, uh, you know, to go to Mars. So I wouldn't worry about your height. Um, another question that came in is, what if the dusts on Mars carry possible Martian microbes? Could an astronaut get infected by the microbes um, if they manage to get through the fabric? Yeah, I mean, you know, and this has nothing to do even with the COVID thing. I mean, this is something we, we've always been aware of. Uh, I, I had a chance to actually ask that question specifically to uh, Dr. Bar Bar Baruch Bloomberg. We call him Barry Bloomberg. He, he's passed away now, but he was the first director of NASA's Astrobiology Institute. So it's an institute that studies life in space, uh, friendly or harmful for that matter. And uh, Barry Bloomberg actually won the Nobel Prize for discovering the hepatitis B virus. Okay, so anyway, he was an expert on viruses. And I asked him this question, you know, should we really fear running into a virus on Mars or a bug? Because I mean, after all, you know, viruses usually have to be tailored to their host, I thought, to, to be harmful to them. And, you know, if Martian life is really that alien, I mean, maybe it's just going to be harmless to us. And he said, no, not necessarily. Uh, there's actually a, you know, a reasonable chance that they could be deadly to not just us, but all life on Earth. And I was, I was astounded by that answer. And, you know, it, it wasn't exactly what I expected. I mean, you know, I, I would especially still want to be careful, but the fact that we know so little about the possibilities of life and that what we know tells us that it could actually be really harmful to us it means that we have to be very, very careful. And I think that the first astronauts who go to Mars, of course, will have the honor of being the first astronauts going to Mars, but they're likely to face a very long quarantine on their way back uh, longer than their trip back uh, just because of what's at stake. Okay. Uh, so, you know, some people say, well, we shouldn't go to Mars at all because you're going to disturb the place because you're going to bring back bugs and we get killed. Okay, that's one extreme of, that's one extreme view. The other extreme view is, well, we should go to Mars and, you know, we'll, we'll trample the life there if there's anything, but there's nothing there anyway. You know, uh, Martian meteorites didn't bring Martian bugs with them, as far as we can tell. So why should we, why should we worry? Let's go. So that's the other extreme where, you know, you, you just explore Mars with reckless abandon. Uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing, this is just a guess, that just from a political standpoint, so to speak, in terms of just dealing with people's anxieties, the, the solution will end up being a compromise where we're going to require, I mean, if you're going to have the honor, the historic honor of being the first people to go to Mars and back, well, you're going to do us the favor of, you know, doing a two to three year quarantine maybe uh, on your way back from Mars. So maybe you hang around the moon for a while or maybe you hang around the space station, but basically you're not coming back to the earth until we're really sure that you're not harboring something that might, for example, take a long while to, to, to gestate, okay? <laughs> to, that'd be latent, okay? And take a long while to, to, to manifest itself. Uh, some viruses, as you know, take years before they really, you know, show detectable sign of their presence. Uh, so we got to be careful. And how would sound be affected on Mars? Would there be sonic booms? Uh, very muffled. The atmosphere is so thin, okay? The atmosphere is so thin that it's like on Earth at very high altitude. So, you know, the atmosphere, as it turns out, is actually thick enough that if you were like really close to another astronaut, you could talk to each other through your bubbles. You know, if the if the space, the air between the helmet visors is is not too 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 big, 
uh, we think that you could actually, you know, yell from one astronaut to the other. <laughs> Just FYI, in case the radio doesn't stop working. But, you know, if you are some distance away, you, you'll hear nothing. And, uh, you know, it's like I said, it, sound waves will just, you know, die pretty, pretty quickly because the air is so thin. Um, what are some advantages of, of having humans go rather than, than robots to Mars? Yeah, that's a question that comes up a lot. It's actually never in those terms that the decision uh, actually is made. It's not like we're, we're going to send humans because at some point we're going to decide that robots can't do the job anymore or that somehow humans will do the, the job of robots much better. I mean, even though humans are better at some things and robots are better at others, uh, the decision to send humans usually has to do with uh, other imperatives. In fact, it has nothing to do with science even. I mean, when we sent Apollo astronauts to the moon, it had nothing to do with science. It was all about beating the Soviet Union, uh, you know, in space. Uh, it was very important strategically for the United States to do that. And this is true also for exploration in, in, in past history. You know, James Cook was not sailing the South Pacific because the British Navy was interested in botany. He, he sailed the South Pacific because the French were there as well. <laughs> okay. And there was a competition. Uh, so, so we don't send people on expeditions to places because of science, which if it was just that could indeed continue to be done by robots. We send people there to occupy the place, to be present because the competition is there. It's just like Antarctica today. In Antarctica, you know, at some cost, we maintain research stations there. It's not because of the science. Science, like on the moon, like in Antarctica, is what you do once you've committed to being there. What else are you gonna do? You're not gonna you know, open a bakery or law firm uh, you're going to explore, you're going to do geology. So science is what you do, is what dominates your activity at these locations. But it's not the reason why you go. The reason why you go is bigger than that. It's, it's national interest. It's whoever is paying the bill finds it important for you to be there. And so, uh, therefore, there's no competition with robots. And we have one more question. Um, Mars and other planets and stars twinkle on Earth because of our atmosphere. On Mars, since the atmosphere is thinner, do stars and Earth and planets look more like what they are? Yeah, they will twinkle less. Uh, although Mars, Mars' atmosphere can have quite a bit of dust loading, and that can't be good for you know astronomical observations. But most of the time, it's going to be clear, cold skies, very still. Thin, thin atmosphere, very good seeing if you are an astronomer, uh, very good seeing when you're on Mars. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful talk and wonderful insights. Um, and thank you to the SETI Institute for partnering with us on this talk. Um, it was a wonderful experience. I'm so grateful for for, uh, for this talk. And um, we will have this talk, we'll be recording this talk and have this available uh, later on as well. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Um, we are, you know, we have our, our virtual programming every Friday evening at 8 p.m. for a variety of at-home programming you can enjoy from your homes. And you can visit our website at shabospace.org and click on the events button to see a complete listings of our upcoming virtual programs. And while we work towards a grand reopening, we appreciate everyone's time and support as we find new ways to learn together. And these events are fueled by you, our community, and a special thanks to our members and donors and partners for helping us bring science to life to everyone at home. Right now, STEM education is more important than ever and we need your help to help us keep these virtual STEM programs free and accessible for everyone. You can go to our website at shabospace.org and you can donate um, there to help us uh, helps STEM education continue on. Thank you all so much. Thank you again, Dr. Lee, for joining us. Thank you, Sadi, and we will see you all next time. Thank you. Bye, everybody.